And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, the United States, Britain and Canada plan to announce a coordinated set of sanctions against Iran. ABC News and The Wall Street Journal report the sanctions will target Iran's oil and petrochemical industry. Last weekend, President Obama warned no options were being taken off the table. The sanctions have enormous bite and enormous scope, and we're building off the platform uh, that uh, has already been established. Uh, the question is, are there additional uh, measures that we can take? And we're going to explore every avenue to see if we can solve this issue diplomatically. Uh, I have said repeatedly, and I will uh, say today, uh, we are not taking any options off the table. International pressure has been mounting on Iran since the U.N. International Atomic Energy Agency revealed in a report the, quote, possible military dimensions to its nuclear activities. The IAEA said credible evidence, quote, indicates Iran has carried out activities relevant to the development of a nuclear explosive device. The IAEA passed a resolution Friday expressing, quote, increasing concern about Iran's nuclear program following the report's findings. The Speaker of Iran's parliament said yesterday Iran would review its relations with the IAEA following the report. Ali Larajani indicated it may be difficult for Iran to continue to cooperate with a nuclear watchdog. If the agency acts within the framework of the Charter, we accept that we are a member of it and will carry out our responsibilities. But if the agency wants to deviate from its responsibilities, then it should not expect the others' cooperation. Iranian parliamentary speaker. Meanwhile, some Iranians have expressed the desire for increased cooperation with the IAEA. Considering the fact that the government has made plenty of clarifications, it would be better for it to expand its cooperation with the IAEA and let them see for themselves, close up, so there would be no pretext for the superpowers. Last week, the Pentagon confirmed it has received massive new bunker-busting bombs capable of destroying underground sites, including Iran's nuclear facilities. The 30,000-pound bombs are six times the size of the Air Force's current arsenal of bunker busters. The new sanctions against Iran also follow last month's allegations by the United States that Iranian officials were involved in a thwarted plot to kill the Saudi ambassador to Washington. The U.S. is expected to announce today that Iran's financial sector is of primary money laundering concern. This phrase activates a section of the USA Patriot Act that warns European, Asian and Latin American companies they could be prevented from doing business with the United States if they continue to work with Iran. Well, to talk more about the sanctions and the implications of the IAEA report, we go to Washington, D.C., to speak with Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch. He's been reporting on Iran and the bomb for the past decade. His latest piece is titled Iran and the IAEA. It's in The New Yorker. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Sai. Uh, talk about what you feel um, uh, should be understood about what's happening in Iran right now in regards to its nuclear power um, sector. Well, you, you mentioned going in—by the way, the, the piece was in the blog. It wasn't in the magazine. It was on the web page. But um, you mentioned Iraq. It's This is almost the same sort of— I don't know if you want to call it a psychosis, but it's some sort of a, a, a fantasy land being built up here, uh, as it was with Iraq. The same sort of I, no lessons, no lessons learned. Obviously, look, uh, I have been reporting uh, about Iran, and I can tell you that since '04, uh, under uh, George Bush and particularly uh, the Vice President Mr. Cheney, uh, we were uh, Cheney was particularly concerned there were secret facilities for building a weapon, which are much different than the enrichment. We have enrichment in Iran; they've acknowledged it. They have inspectors there. There are cameras there, et cetera. This is all. Iran's a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Nobody's accusing them of any cheating. In fact, the latest report that everybody's so um, agog about uh, also says that, once again, we find no evidence that Iran, uh, Iran has diver diverted any uranium that it's enriching. And it's also enriching, enriching essentially to very low levels for peaceful purposes, so they say, 3.8 percent. Um, and so. There is a small percentage being enriched to 20 percent for medical uh, uh, use, but that's quite small, also under cameras, under inspection. Uh, what you have is, um, uh, in those days, in 04, 05, 06, or 07, even until the end of their, uh, their term in office, Cheney ke uh, kept on having the Joint Special Operations Force uh, Command, JSOC. Uh, they would send teams inside uh, Iran. 
they would work with various dissident groups, the Azeris, the Kurds, even Jandela, which is a very fanatic Sunni uh, opposition group. Um, and they would uh, do everything they could to try and find evidence of an undeclared underground facility. Uh, we monitored everything. We have incredible surveillance. In those days, uh, what we did then, we can even do better now. And some of the stuff is very technical, very classified. But I can tell you, there's not much you can do in Iran right now with us without us finding out something about it. They found nothing, nothing, no evidence of any weaponization. In other words, no evidence of a, of a facility to build the bomb. They have facilities to enrich, but not separate facilities for building a bomb. This is simply a fact. We haven't found it if it does exist. It's still a fantasy. We still want to think, many people do think it does. The big change was in the, uh, in the last few weeks, the IAEA came out with a new report. Um, and um, it's not a, a scientific report. It's, it's a political document. It takes a lot of the old allegations that have been made over the years that were looked at by the IAEA under the regime or the directorship of Mohammed el Baradi, who ran uh, the IAEA for 12 years, the Egyptian. He won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work. Somebody who was very skeptical of, uh, of Iran in the beginning and became less so as Iran went, went, was more and more open. But the new director of the IAEA, a Japanese official named Amano, um, uh, an old um, sort of from the center-right party in Japan. I'm sure he's an honorable guy. He believes what he believes. But we happen to have a series of WikiLeaks documents uh, from the American embassy uh, in uh, Vienna, one of the embassies in Vienna, reporting on how great it was to get a mono there. This is uh, last year. These documents were released by the Julian Assange's group. Um, and are quite important because what the documents say is that Amano has pledged his fail fealty to America. I understand that, uh, he was elected as a, he's a marginal candidate. We supported him very much. Six ballots. He was considered weak by everybody, but we pushed to get him in. We did get him in. He, he responded by thanking us and saying he shares our views. He shares our views of, on Iran. He's going to be do. He's basically. It was just an expression of love. He's going to do what we wanted. This new report has nothing new in it. This isn't me talking. This is, uh, I, in, in the piece I did for the New Yorker blog, um, it's different for the blog because it has more reporting in it. I talked to former inspectors. There are different voices than you read in the New York Times and the Washington Post. There are other people that don't get reported who are much more skeptical of this report. And you just don't see it in the, in the coverage. So what we're getting is a very small slice in the newspaper, mainstream press here, of, um, of, of analysis of this report, there's a completely different analysis, which is very little new. And the way it works, Amy, is over the years, a, um, a, a report will show up in a London newspaper that'll turn out to be spurious, it'll turn out to be propaganda, whether started by us or a European intelligence agency. It's not clear. This all happened, if you remember the Ahmed Shalabi stuff um, during the buildup to the war in Iran. <clears throat> All about, um, uh, you know, the, um, the great arsenals that existed inside Iran. Uh, the same sort of propaganda is being used now. <clears throat> pardon me, I have a slight cold. Um, that uh, shows up over the years, over the last decade, in various newspapers. The IAEA would look at it, rule it not to be be a fabrication, or certainly not to be supportable by anything they know. All of these old reports, with the exception of, I think, in the new study that was put out by the IAEA. There were maybe 30 or 40 old items with only three things past 2008, all of which are they, uh, many people on the, in, inside the IAEA believe to be spurious, not very reliable fabrications. So there you are. So, Cy Hirsch, you're saying um, that it's not new information, it's a new head of the IAEA that's making the difference here. Can you talk more about U.S. infiltration of Iran, JSOC and Iran surveillance um, as well in Iran? Sure. I mean, the kind of stuff they did. I can tell you stuff that um, um, that was secret uh, eight, nine years ago. We would, for example, we developed, if there was an underground facility we thought was where we saw some digging let's say, in a mountain area. We would line the road when there were trucks going up and down the road. We would lie, line the road with what seemed to be pebbles. In fact, they were sensors that could measure the weight of trucks going in and out. If a truck would go in light and come out with heavy, we could assume it was coming out with dirt. They were doing digging. We did that kind of monitoring. We also put all sorts of passive 
uh, 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 counters, measures of radioacti radioactivity. Uranium, even plutonium, most of the stuff that's being done there is enriched uranium. They're not making plutonium. But um, uh, you can track it. At a certain point, you have to move it. Once you take it out and start moving it around, you can track it. You can find the Geiger counters, if you will, to use that old-fashioned term. You can measure radioactivity and see increases. We would go into a building. <coughs> our troops, are, are, uh, sometimes even with Americans, go into a building in Tehran where we thought there was something uh, fishy going on, start a disturbance down the street, take out a few bricks, slam in another section of brick with a, with a, a Geiger counter, if you will, or a measuring device to see if in that building they were doing some enrichment we didn't know about. And we also have incredible com competence at looking for air holes uh, from the air, from satellites. If you're building an underground facility, you have to vent it. You have to get air into it. You have to find a way to remove bad air and put in fresh air. And so we have guys that are experts, uh, tremendous people in the community. Some of them retired and set up a private company to do this. They would w monitor all of the aerial surveillance to look for air holes so we could find a pattern, try to find a pattern of an underground, underground facility. Nada. We came up with nothing. And the most important thing is we also, and the IA, even this new report also says, let me emphasize this. If you're not diverting um, uh, uranium, if you're not taking uranium out of the count and smuggling it someplace so that you can build a bomb, and that the IAEA is, is absolutely categorical on everything that they are enriching, whatever percentage they enrich to is under camera inspection and under inspection of inspections. It's all open under the treaty, uh, the safeguard treaty. Uh, um, uh, nobody's accusing Iran of violating the, the treaty. They're just accusing them of cheating on the side or some evidence they are. And there's been no evidence of a diversion. So if you're going to make a bomb, you're going to have to bring it in from someplace else. And given the kind of surveillance we have, that's going to be hard to do, to import it from a third country, bring in uranium and enrich it, or enrich uranium. It's just a long shot. And what you have is, as I said, it's, it's some sort of a hysteria that we had over Iraq that's coming up again in Iran. And this isn't a plea for Iran. There's a lot of things that the Iranians do that are, is objectionable, the way they treat dissent, et cetera, et cetera. So this, I'm just speaking within the context of the hull and blue that's up now. And as far as sanctions are concerned, you know, excuse me, we've been sanctioning uh, Cuba for 60 years, and Castro is, is you know, is, he may be ill, but he's still there. Sanctions are not going to work. This is a country that produces oil and gas. Uh, less and less, but still plenty of it. And they have customers uh, the, in the Far East, uh, the Iranians. Um, um, they have customers for their, for their energy. We're the losers in this. How would you compare the Obama administration to the Bush administration when it comes to Iran? Um, uh, I can't find a comparison. Same, a little less bellicose, but the same thing. Um, I do think, uh, I have every reason to believe that, um, uh, unlike Mr. Bush, uh, uh, President Obama really is worried about an attack. He doesn't want to see the Israelis bomb uh, Iran. That's the kind of talk we've been getting in the press lately. And there's new, as you mentioned, the 30,000-pound bombs built by Boeing, I think. Um, the problem is that most of Iran's facilities, the ones that we know about, the declared facilities under camera inspection, a place called the Tans, is about 80, 75 to 80 feet underground. And you'd have to do a hell of a lot of bombing. Uh, to do much damage to it. You could certainly do damage to it, but the cost uh, internationally would be stupendous. I, there's, the argument for going and bombing is so vague and so nil. There's been studies done showing uh, technical studies, MIT and other places, and the Israeli government also has had its scientists participate in these studies, showing it would be really hard uh, to do a significant amount of damage, uh, given how deep the underground facilities are. Uh, but you hear this talk about it, it's, it's, and there's you know, uh, look, this, is, this president has said nothing about what's going on in Tahrir Square again. Uh, we're mute. Uh, he's been uh, mute on this kind of uh, uh, the bellicosity. But I, my understanding is that um, uh, purely from um, uh, inside information is that uh, he does understand uh, the issues more. I think it's right now a political game being played by him um, to look tough. You know, everybody's well, chasing, you know, the independent vote. I don't know why what's so important to to go after people I can't decide whether they're Democrats or Republicans, but that seems to be the name of the game. Well, let's turn to the response in Israel to the IAEA report. Yesterday, Israeli Defense Minister Hud Barak said in an interview with CNN, the time has come to deal with Iran. When asked specifically whether Israel would attack Iran, this is how he responded. I don't think that that's a subject for, for public uh, discussion. Uh, but I can tell you that, uh, that the IAEA report 
is, uh, has a sobering impact on many in the world, leaders as well as the publics. And people understand that the time had come. Amano told straightly what he found, unlike Baradei. And uh, it, it became a major issue that I think duly so uh, becomes a major uh, issue for sanctions, for intensive diplomacy with urgency. People understand now that Iran is determined to reach nuclear weapons. No other possible or conceivable explanation for what they had been actually doing, and that should be stopped. That was the Israeli defense minister, Hud Barak. Asai, your response? Well, uh, uh, what makes me nervous is uh, Barak and uh, Bibi, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, are, are together on this. They, they're not always together on many things. They both agree. Um, and that's worrisome because, uh, again, it's a political issue there. Everybody, the country is moving quickly to the right, Israel is, obviously. And um, I, I can just tell you that I've also talked. Um, un unfortunately, the ground rules are so lousy in Israel, I can't, re I, can't re I can't write it. But I've talked to very senior intelligence people in Iran, in Israel, rather. If you notice, it, you, you don't hear that much about it, but the former head of Mossad, Meyer Dagan, who uh, left, uh, who was the guy that orchestrated the attempted assassinations in Dubai, et cetera, no dove, has been vehement about the, uh, the foolishness of attempting to go after Iran, on the grounds that it's not clear what they have. They're certainly far away from a bomb. Israel's been saying for 20 years they're, you know, six months away from making a bomb. But I can tell you that I've talked to senior Israeli officers in Israel who have told me, A, uh, they know that Iran, as the, um, uh, as the American intelligence community reported, um, uh, I think it was in 07, uh, the, there was a national intelligence estimate that became public that said, essentially, Iran did look at the bomb. They had an eight-year war with Iraq, a terrible war, 1980 to 1988. And we, by the way, the United States sided with Iraq, Saddam Hussein at that time. Iran then, in the years after that, they began to worry about Iraq's talk about building a nuclear weapon. So they did look in that period, let's say 87 to 2000, 97 to 2003, no question, the American NIE said in 07, it was um, augmented in 2011. I wrote about it a year ago in The New Yorker. It said, yes, they did look at a bomb, um, but um, not to, they knew that they couldn't, there's no way they could make a bomb to deter America or Israel. They're, they're not fools. This Persian society has been around for a couple thousand years. They can't deter us. We have too many bombs. They thought maybe they could deter Iraq. After we went in and took down Iraq uh, in 03, they stopped. So they had done some studies. We're talking about computer modeling, et cetera, no building. They no question they looked at the idea of getting a bomb or getting to the point where maybe they could make one. Um, they did do that, but they stopped in 03. That's still the American consensus. Uh, the Israelis will tell you privately, yes, we agree. They stopped most of their planning, even their studies, in 03. The Israeli position is they stopped not because they saw what we did to Iraq, but they thought that we could we destroyed Iraq. I had a general tell me this. We destroyed Iraq. In, um, it took them, uh, we did in three weeks what they couldn't do in eight years. They thought they would be next. But the consensus was, yes, they stopped. And also, if you ask serious, smart, wise Israelis in the intelligence business, and there are many, do you really think if they got a bomb and they don't have one now, they would hit Tel Aviv? And the answer was, you think they're crazy? We would incinerate them. Of course not. They've been around 2,000 years. That's not going to happen. Their fear was they would give a bomb to somebody else, et cetera. But there's an element of ra rationality in the Israeli intelligence community that's not being expressed by the political leadership. It's the same madness we have here. Uh, there's an element of rationality in our intelligence community which says, in 07, and it, ascended, it said and again last year, they don't have the bomb. They're not making it. It's an NIE. Sixteen agencies agreed, 16 to nothing, in an internal vote before that. Uh, they did an update in 2011 on the 07 study and came to the same place. It's just not there. That doesn't mean they don't have dreams. It doesn't mean scientists don't do computer studies. It doesn't mean that uh, physicists at the University of uh, Tehran don't do what physicists like to do, write papers and do studies. But there's just no evidence of any systematic effort to go from enriching uranium to making a bomb. It's a huge, difficult process. You have to take a very hot gas and convert it into a metal and then convert it into a core. And you have to do that by remote control because you can't get near that stuff. It'll kill you. So radioactive. I mean, so, I look, 
I'm a lone voice. And you know how careful the New Yorker is, even in a blog item. This piece was checked and rechecked. And I quote people, uh, Joe Cirincioni, an American who has been involved in this army many years. These are different voices than you're seeing in the, in the papers. I, I sometimes get offended by the same voices we see in The New York Times and Washington Post. We don't see people with different points of view. There are inside the uh, not only the American intelligence community, but also inside the uh, IAEA in Vienna. There are many people who cannot stand what Amano is doing, and many people who basically um, I, I get emails. In the, this piece came out uh, was put up uh, I think over the weekend, and um, I get emails like, like crazy uh, from people on the inside saying, "Way to go." Uh, I've talked about inside the IAEA. It's, it's an organization that doesn't deal with the press, but internally, they're very bothered by the direction Amano is taking them. It's not a scientific study, Amy. It's a political document, and it's a political document in which he's playing our game. And it's the same game the Israelis are picking up on and those who don't like Iran. And I, I wish we could separate our feelings about Iran and the mullahs and what happened with the, with the students from 1979 into the reality, which is that I think there's a very serious chance the Iranians would certainly give us the kind of inspections we want uh, in return uh, for a little love, an end to sanctions and a respect that they insist that they want to get from us. And it's not happening from this administration. Seymour Hersh, I want to thank you very much for being with us. His latest piece is on the blog at The New Yorker. It's called Iran and the IAEA. Seymour Hersh won the Pulitzer Prize. His uh, piece you can see at uh, The New Yorker's website. This is Democracy Now!